You are listening to The Bridge Busters, The First Dam Busters and The Race to Save Britain by Mark Felton, published by Mandalay Books and narrated by Mark Felton. Chapter 3 Kaiser Bill's Canal Obviously the best way to cripple Hitler's war machine is to strike at his industrial and weapons manufacturing capabilities, Wing Commander Bennett stated matter-of-factly to Air Chief Marshal Ludlow Hewitt. The head of Bomber Command concurred. Handily for us, sir, the Germans have mostly located them in the one area of northwestern Germany that is within striking distance of five groups' airfields in Lincolnshire. Ludlow Hewitt was warming to Bennett's presentation. Any cursory glance at the intelligence material gathered by the planning staff revealed that the canals, particularly the Dortmund Ems, were definitely Hitler's weak points the vulnerable nodes that could perhaps be severed by the RAF. The dortmund Ems Canal had been opened in 1899 during the rule of another German megalomaniac, Emperor Wilhelm II, and was the result of over 300 years of gradual improvements to West Germany's internal water transportation system. The impetus to construct the Great Canal had really heated up with the Industrial Revolution and a determination by Germany to wean itself off cheap imported English coal to power its factories and heat its homes. Rich industrialists and prominent city burghers rekindled interest in a Grand Canal for moving the vast quantities of coal, goods and other materials produced using water transport because a railway built in 1856 had struggled to cope. The planners eventually focused on one connection, a link between the Ruhr and the North Sea. Out of the Ruhr would flow coal and industrial manufactures, while in turn Swedish iron ore and other necessities would be imported into Germany. 4,000 workers had laboured for seven years to complete the canal, moving over 812 million cubic feet of earth and rock, constructing 19 locks and 273 culverts and aqueducts, as well as a huge ship lift at Heinrichenburg to transfer vessels the 45-foot height difference from the Herne to the Dortmund branch of the canal. A further project completed in 1914 saw the construction of the Mitterland Canal from the Rhine to the Lower Weser, directly linking the Dortmund Ems Canal with Germany's mightiest river. Bomber Command had not yet been given permission to go after the Ruhr, largely through fear of being the first combatant to deliberately create civilian casualties and earn widespread international opprobrium. But there was no harm in looking, reasoned Wing Commander Bennett. His job was to plan for the future, and a widening of targets was inevitable as hostilities spread. A 50-mile stretch of the canal between its junctions with two other waterways, the Mitterland and Lipper canals here, near the towns of Riesenbeck and Dateln respectively, interests us, sir, Bennett explained at his meeting at Bomber Command headquarters in early January 1940. It is the only connection by water in Germany between the Ruhr and the rest of northern and central Germany, including all of Hitler's vital seaports. Ludlow Hewitt asked how much traffic passed through the canal each day. Bennett quickly rifled through some files that he had brought with him. According to intelligence sources, sir, Bennett said, finding the data, each day heavily laden barges move along the canal loaded with the equivalent of 100 steam trains worth of goods and equipment. That's an average of about 600 tonnes per barge, sir. He looked up at Ludlow Hewitt, who raised one eyebrow in genuine surprise. And all of it moving along a canal less than a hundred feet wide, sir, Bennett said, a slightly mischievous smile raising one corner of his mouth. Bennett, returning to the large map spread out on the table, ran his finger along the stretch of canal near the city of Münster. The canal was forced to cross the river Ems, which meandered. The Germans had built two aqueducts, M25 and her sister, M25A, to move the barges over the river. That was where Bennett thought the canal was most vulnerable to an attack. 
Ludlow Hewitt asked for more details from the aqueducts. Bennett returned to his files, placing several black-and-white aerial reconnaissance photographs on the table. Ludlow Hewitt picked up a magnifying glass and bent closer to examine the structures. M25, the oldest aqueduct, was completed in 1897, Bennett said, pointing the structure out with his finger on the big map. It's 157 feet long and 61 feet wide, and built of concrete and sandstone, with ornamental arches of hard brick. The structure has been waterproof with cement and lead plates. Ludlow Hewitt, his finger moving to the other aqueduct close by and running parallel to the older structure, asked for more details. The Germans, sir, as one would expect, have been thorough, Bennett replied. In order to forestall any future use of aeroplanes against the canal, a second 164-foot-long aqueduct was constructed in 1935 over the Ems on a short bypass beside the older structure. We've codenamed this M25A. It's built of reinforced concrete and fitted with electrically raised safety gates at each end. For a while, neither man spoke as Ludlow Hewitt studied the photographs. We need to knock down these two aqueducts, sir, Bennett said, breaking the silence. They are the obvious choke points in the system. If we can destroy or severely damage them, the canal traffic would be shut down for weeks, perhaps even for months, causing untold problems to Hitler's war machine. The potential to retard armaments production, not to mention even power generation by cutting off coal supplies, might force Hitler to delay or even halt offensive plans that many suspected he harboured for Western Europe following his crushing victory over Poland. Ludlow Hewitt was impressed, but he had his reservations. The plan appeared to be deceptively simple, he said, but it evidently would not be that easy to attack the aqueducts. The importance of the targets was obvious, but actually destroying such well-made, solid structures was where things started to get complicated. Ludlow Hewitt knew well the limitations of his aircraft and their dismal bombing accuracy. Before planning could proceed further, it was agreed that Bennett would discover how much explosive power would be required to collapse the aqueducts, and whether the RAF had anything in its armoury that could do the job under present circumstances. Ludlow Hewitt, in his rather schoolmasterly way, drew the meeting to a close. He praised Bennett's work, but ordered that he find out what kind of bomb would be best suited to the task in hand. Without the right weapon, the mission could remain only a theoretical exercise. Wing Commander Bennett completely agreed. I'll get on to the back room, boys, at once, sir, he said, gathering up his maps and photographs. He already had someone in mind to undertake a technical appraisal of the problem such a mission as this had thrown up. The Air Ministry had a special department dedicated to the scientific application of air power against targets. A team of dedicated servicemen and civilians staffed it from across the engineering disciplines. As to what type of aircraft to use on jobs such as this, Bennett knew that a precision raid would entail using either the Handley Page Hamden or the Bristol Blenheim, both medium day bombers with a fairly adequate ordnance load. The much bigger and less agile Wellingtons and Whitleys would not be suited to such a task. For sheer aerial agility, the Hamden would be the likeliest choice, even though it had shown itself up to be obsolescent in combat and a crew killer. But for now, this was mere speculation, for regardless of which squadrons were selected, the ordnance that they intended to deliver had to be able to do the job in the first place. Once back in his office at the Air Ministry, Bennett sent a note over to the Directorate of Works, an organisation composed of various types of civil and military engineers, requesting their best explosives man. Later that day, Major J.C. Hurd presented himself at Bennett's office. An officer in the Royal Engineers rather than the RAF, Hurd had been seconded to the Directorate just before the war due to his knowledge and experience with explosives. The middle-aged major was ushered into Bennett's office, where he found the wing commander friendly and welcoming. Though much younger than Hurd, Bennett nonetheless outranked the technical expert. 
Heard wore his khaki service uniform with Sam Brown belt, major's crowns on his shoulders, with a splash of colour provided by a row of metal ribbons above his left breast pocket. Heard had been blowing things up since Bennett had been at school, and the ribbon of the military cross in front of his Great War service ribbons silently demonstrated his bravery. The two men settled into chairs, Bennett offering Heard a cigarette before lighting up himself. "'I gather that you desire something demolished, sir,' Heard said in a clipped accent, dropping an extinguished match into the glass ashtray on Bennett's desk. Bennett replied that he did, and passed over the reconnaissance photographs of the two aqueducts that he had shown to Ludlow Hewitt. "'I'd like your opinion about these,' Bennett said, also passing across a brief typed appraisal of the target, and then adding a single type sheet of figures with engineering estimates for each of the structures. Heard said nothing for some time, simply perused the materials with the comfortable eye of a professional in his field. Bennett stood and looked out the window at the wintry rooftops and smoked. The only sound in the room was the ticking of a clock above the mantel. After a while, Heard put down the papers and looked up at Bennett, who turned from the window. "'Tricky, sir, very tricky,' Heard said slowly, his eyes returning to one of the photographs. Bennett sighed. "'But in your opinion, not impossible?' he asked, resuming his seat. "'No,' Heard replied carefully, a wry smile creasing his lips. "'Not impossible. Any problem can usually be resolved with the correct application of high explosives.' I want you to begin an investigation right away, Bennett said. I need data on the effects of general-purpose aerial bombs against this type of structure when dropped from differing altitudes and at different speeds. Bennett handed Heard a copy, the rest of the slim file containing all of the intelligence material the RAF had gleaned concerning the construction of the two aqueducts, including photographs and mathematical data. His entire focus would be on trying to find the right bomb to use from the existing stock of aerial weapons and its size and release parameters to cause maximum structural damage to the aqueducts. Don't worry, sir. We'll find a way, Heard said as he rose to leave the meeting. I'm sure of it, Bennett replied warmly, seeing him to the office door and shaking his hand. He would have his data within days. As he left the meeting, Major Heard knew that he had his work cut out. Both structures were solid and well-built examples of German civil engineering. From prior experience, he also knew that the RAF's limited selection of bombs was not promising for such a difficult target, and that the entire mission presented him with a set of challenges he had not faced before. But he meant what he had said to Bennett. He would find a way. Major Hurd's tests were at this stage entirely theoretical. The Air Ministry's research and development arm had already prepared a detailed report earlier in the war that gave the effects of various sizes of detonations on experimental model walls, and Heard was able to use this raw data to extrapolate the likely effects existing bombs would have on the two German aqueducts, given the dimensions that he had to hand. He also gave another department the job of designing an aqueduct of the same span, width and height as the two target structures, and their findings tallied more or less with Hurd's. After several days of feverish work, Hurd's report was typed up and sent over to the Air Ministry by courier. On the 12th of January 1940, Major Hurd's report arrived at Wing Commander Bennett's office. Bennett had just arrived for work and hastily divested himself of his cap and greatcoat as he hurried over to his desk, a flutter of excitement in the pit of his stomach. He ordered a pot of tea and sat down to read. But it was soon obvious that there was a problem. The RAF had two large general purpose or GP bombs then in service, the 500 and 1,000 pounders. Major Heard had, as Bennett expected, made all of his calculations based upon the deployment of these bombs. As Bennett perused the tightly typed four-page report, his mind absorbing release altitude data, angles of impact, velocities and penetration, it became clear that the aqueducts were very awkward targets indeed, exactly as Heard had warned him that they might be. It all came down to one simple conclusion – 
In Major Hurd's opinion, the bombs currently in service were not powerful enough to be able to penetrate the concrete floors of the aqueducts to the point of causing a total structural collapse and draining the canal. At best they would produce cracks and dislodge some of the concrete, damage that the Germans could make good relatively easily. Other bombs drop would probably miss the concrete floors and glance off the aqueduct's walls without causing any significant damage. Greater damage could be achieved by hitting the canal banks either side of the aqueducts, partially collapsing their walls, but this would still leave the aqueducts undamaged. The Germans could make good the destruction wrought without undue difficulty. The idea of striking the canal banks had in fact already been mooted to Bennett by Lieutenant Child in Rotterdam. He had made the point from his own personal observations of the banks from before the war. In Child's opinion, the banks were weak, consisting of puddled clay with no concrete facing, standing about six feet broad at the top. Major Heard did make the point that greater penetration and damage could be achieved if the bombs were released from above 2,000 feet, but then accuracy would become a major issue from a third of a mile up, as RAF bombers were almost incapable of precision attacks at this time. In order to ensure the maximum damage to the aqueducts from this increased height, a large diversion of planes and manpower would be required to make a saturation raid. Basically, a large formation of planes could plaster the entire area in the hope of getting lucky and landing a few of their bombs on target. Bennett frowned and leaned back in his chair, thinking for a moment. He reached for a cigarette and lit it. The report was brief and to the point. The fact remained that intelligence reports demonstrated that the densest traffic on the Dortmund-Ems Canal lay close to the junction with the Mitterlan Canal at Riesenbeck, and that meant the section that crossed the river Ems, with its vulnerable pair of aqueducts, M25 and M25A. Bennett knew they were too good as targets to be put to one side because of the issue of available bombs. The results of a successful strike would be war-changing. Now that Heard had identified the main issue, that of the bombs to be used, this problem could, hopefully, be overcome if given sufficient time and resources. However, first Bennett needed to be sure that Heard's general findings were correct. He sighed and reached for a pen and a pad of headed notepaper. He would, in the time-honoured manner of those who had received a bad prognosis, seek a second opinion. The report would be forwarded for further scientific analysis to Sir Henry Tizard, a brilliant chemist and one of the fathers of radar. It was hoped that Tizard could recommend someone who could look afresh at the problem. Bomber commander anxious to obtain expert advice regarding the best type of bomb and the weight of the attack which would be necessary to put these aqueducts out of action, Bennett wrote dispassionately. Now it all came down to bombs and time, neither of which commodities RAF Bomber Command had in abundance in January 1940. Tune in again for the next instalment of The Bridge Busters. If you can't wait that long, paperback and Kindle versions of the book are available. See the link in the description box. You have been listening to The Bridge Busters, written and narrated by Mark Felton, on War Stories with Mark Felton. For great documentary films on many military subjects, visit the YouTube channel Mark Felton Productions. Hit the subscribe buttons for both channels to make sure you don't miss any of the action. 